podcast. Okay, try that again. There you go, you're good to go. All right, great, thank you for that. Um, thank you. All right, guys, sorry for the restart, but hi, my name is Charlie Berger. I'm the Senior Director of Product Management. I will be giving you an overview uh, and uh, describing what's new, talking about some example customers, and talking about some example applications on Oracle Machine Learning. I think we have, what, about 45 minutes for this uh, talk, I think. And um, so here's the Oracle version of the slide that also has my contact information, uh, charlie.berger at oracle.com, and you can also follow me on Twitter should you want to do that. Uh, but uh, what I'll try to do now is talk about what Oracle machine learning really is, and it really is all about moving the algorithms, not the data. It's based on the premise that as you get, you know, you need to, to do machine learning, you need two things. You need data and you need al algorithms. And typically those are stored or managed in two different kind of platforms. There's the data management platform, the data repository, the data lake, the database, the data warehouse, and then there's, you know, Python, R, SAS, SPSS, analytical compute kind of platforms. And the strategy that Oracle took a long time ago was to move the algorithms, not the data. Wouldn't it make a lot more sense to teach a 40-year-old relational database how to do advanced math? And that's what we've been doing. Now, no one else really in the industry has been taking the same kind of strategy up until just about the last couple of years where you start to see Google do the same thing. Google BigQuery ML is going down this approach. And I consider that sort of validation of the strategy. Everyone else still does it the the sort of um, uh, classical way of, of taking the data out, moving over to somewhere else, building a model, and then they're faced with the challenge of how do you get that model, that predictive, you know, that, that numerical recipe equation, whatever you want to call it, how do you get that to apply to new data? Uh, well, that's where most data science projects fail. If you do it all inside the database, it's a lot more straightforward. So there's a little bit of background on me. Um, I've been in the business for a while, and uh, I'm also the co-founder of the Analytics and Data Oracle user community as well. And um, so enough about me. You can read that later on. But um, a couple of questions for you that I, I find kind of interesting, just because I've been around for a while, and you kind of start to observe things, I guess. And the, the, the point that I'm trying to make here is, you store all this data, you know, you, you, you collect records about your patients or about your customers or about transactions or about your, your, your refinery business or your retail business or your restaurant, whatever it is. You store all this data, but what do you do with it? Does it just stay in a file cabinet? How much potential value, like insights and patterns and correlations and predictions do you think could be obtained from that data? How much information can you harvest from your data? And if you think you could harvest a lot more than you're currently harvesting from your data, what are the obstacles that are preventing you? Okay, those are the two big meta questions I want you to kind of ponder for a little bit. And Oracle strategy is, uh, and has been on this uh, strategy of, let's not have 12 different databases, a database for uh, transformations uh, or a platform for ETL, a platform for spatial, a platform for machine learning and a platform for JSON and, and text. Let's have a converged database. So the Oracle Autonomous Database is the sort of preeminent uh, example of this that we have, where it's uh, just a complete uh, offering that's also automated for you. But all of the functionality that I'm talking about here is also available um, on prem on premises. So you can you can do these things in the cloud on prem uh, in any kind of hybrid environment that you want to. And if you compare this to the way that other people do um, all of these different, you know, components of spatial, graph, machine learning, JSON, text, OLAP, and so on. They all have sort of, you know, fragmented platforms and tools. They schlep the data back and forth between all of them, and they get it to work because they have to. But if you think about the simpler integrated converged database architecture that Oracle has been, you know, going down this path for years on, uh, you kind of think, oh, well, if my you know, if I had one Swiss Army knife that could do everything and do it pretty well, that's better than a bunch of different separate platforms and tools. And so that's what we're all about. And when you do that, it also enables a lot of other things. And I think it enables things that, that favor um, people being able to do more advanced uh, uh, things with their data. And I think, and I've seen and observed people sort of evolving more to that, uh, of, of the role of more of a data scientist or maybe an application developer that embeds machine learning into applications. 
So as Oracle and other companies, I guess, have, have been trying to simplify and automate more and more things, you, you get to kind of move up this food chain. And in particular with Oracle, with JSON data types and machine learning and graph and spatial, and I forget what that icon is supposed to be, but um, it, it just has, you know, it provides the user with a, a plethora of different tools and functionality, all in a simpler, smarter architecture that allows you to do so much more, so much faster and go directly to production, which is where most machine learning projects fail, frankly. So the way that we do this is by moving the algorithms to the data. And uh, on the right, you'll see something called the naive Bayes algorithm. It was invented by Lord Bayes way back in, I think, 1670 is when he published his paper. And that is just, it's, a, it's an algorithm that's just based on counting. So the example I always use is um, you're trying to figure out who's going to likely buy a motorcycle. Well, let's take a look at who's bought, purchased a motorcycle in the past. And let's look at gender. And let's look at the number of people that buy a motorcycle that are male versus female. Let's look at whether or not they rent a house, rent an apartment or own a house. Let's look if they're a dog lover or a cat lover and on and on and on. And when we get to values that are numerical values like salary, income or height or weight, we bin that and we count the number of times that this particular record is in bin three or bin seven or bin, bin 15 or whatever you want to have. Well, we moved that into the database years ago in release 9.2 of the database. Um, and we did that algorithm and the um, market basket analysis algorithms first because they are very, they lend themselves to being implemented in a relational database construct, right? They are just counting and the database can use the optimizer, it can count things. Uh, very, very quickly, it can use all the parallelization of the database. And so those were the first ones that we implemented, but we didn't stop there, we kept on going. And with each major release of the database, we added one, two or three more algorithms in general. And we also, so now we're up to like over 30 algorithms. And all those algorithms also take advantage of all the other functions of the database, like text or aggregations or spatial or graph, all that other, uh, all those other features of the database are all fair game for us while we're now in the database. We also realize that not everyone speaks only SQL. A lot of data scientists will speak Python today or R. And so we wrap and expose those algorithms and integrate them with open source. So now you have sort of a multilingual uh, approach to the algorithms that are inside the database. And so today I think you can really sort of think about it as maybe an AI database, a thinking database. It really opens up a lot of opportunities. And I, and I say these words very cautiously because I did live, live through previous AI winters. And I know the overhyping, the over explanation, you know, the overhyping of, of this stuff. But I think if you think of all of the data you have in the database now and the ability to analyze that data in situ with the machine learning algorithms, and then now not only store Charlie's uh, income and my checking account balance and my, you know, probability of buying a Tesla, I mean, my, my, do I own a Tesla car or not? I can also have the, 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 the predicted value of my checking account, the predicted likelihood I'm going to buy this product or that product, and everything about me can be the actual and predicted, and I can even do a sort of uh, the difference between actual and predicted, and I can really operate in a much more proactive sense rather than just using the database as a rear view mirror. So what we're talking about is called Oracle Machine Learning. Since uh, December 5th, 2019, when Willie Hardy posted a blog that hopefully you read, because if you didn't read it, you may not know this, Oracle Machine Learning has been a free, no license required feature of the database. So it extends the database. It, uh, it's something you can use today. It, it delivers over 30 powerful in-database uh, algorithms, plus the which are all at their core SQL APIs, plus integration with open source Python and R. And depending on if you're using the native SQL, it's called OML for SQL. Uh, if you're using the integration with R, that's called OML for R. Uh, the integration with Python, OML for Py. If you're using what most people use on-prem would be Oracle Data Miner. It's a SQL developer drag and drop extension. So you go to SQL developer, you drag and drop, and that's what most people use on-prem today. Uh, up on the cloud and autonomous, we have these collaborative Oracle machine learning notebooks that are based on Zeppelin technology. Uh, we've just added in the OML auto ML user interface to the notebook so that I should probably move that up close to that, but um, that allows you to sort of do six clicks, click, 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 and and uh, and we'll build a good model for you using some uh, methodologies we call auto ML. Uh, more on that as we dive into the presentation and demos here. Um, and then finally, OML, OML services, which provide a REST API for you to deploy the models beyond the database. So if you don't want to you know, hit the database for a prediction or query the, 
you know, uh, apply the model inside the database. You just want to do a mini batch type of approach and say, here's some records. Give me a, give me some predictions on this uh, through a REST uh, and endpoint approach. You can do that as well. So what we're trying to do with this overall uh, architecture is to make machine learning simple, right? Depending on what language you speak, depending on what user interface you, you like, um, you can analyze your data in situ and uh, generate predictions and insights. Now, the other part of this, I've said a few different times, um, it's included in the Oracle database, the autonomous database licenses. You do not require, you know, you don't have to put any more quarters into Oracle to use this. It comes included in the database. So I always think of this as a little bit of a public service announcement because so many people are not aware of this. And if you want to start building applications that embed predictions or insights, or you want to use this with Oracle Analytics Cloud and more on both of those in a minute, uh, you now have this much more smarter converged database with all these uh, uh, rich uh, analytical and machine learning capabilities at your at your fingertips. You can do a lot of different things. So hopefully you'll, you'll find this uh, useful and take advantage of it. Uh, in terms of algorithms, we have quite a, a collection these days. Uh, I haven't counted them just lately, uh, but I think it's over 30, 32, 33, something like that. Um, and so in classification, where you're trying to separate, uh, you know, build a predictive model to, to assign members uh, or records to a class like A, B, C, or D, discrete classes, uh, we have several, you know, is it eight or nine uh, techniques there in clustering three different types of techniques and so on. Now, in this listing of algorithms, I think the inter most interesting stuff is, is, um, is at the bottom where we say um, uh, it also supports partitioned models, transactional models, unstructured data, geospatial data, and so on. So if you have a 360-degree view of your customer and some of the information you have uh, are the tweets they've been tweeting out lately, well, I can use Oracle's text mining support to pre-process that data to tokenize it and bring that in as a vector of terms. If you have spatial or graph data, I can bring that in as well. Um, it's not, it does not have to all be a flattened 2D table. You can mine what we call nested tables. So you might have Charlie Burger, my age, my income, my gender, all these kind of things. But then let's say what medications I'm on or what's my marital status. Maybe that's a whole paragraph. Maybe what's my uh, temperature or heartbeat or whatever like that. And you have those as you know, readings that you take. In this, or what sales, what items have I placed into a basket? All of those are, are transactional uh, type of data, and we can mine that data as well. So it really opens up a lot of possibilities, and uh, I think uh, the, the opportunities are endless. There have been a lot of, with, the, with the, some of the new announcements, there's been a lot more coverage of the Oracle uh, Autonomous Database, the Oracle Database, and, of course, the new machine learning uh, advances that we've put into the database. So here's a nice one from, from Bradley Shimon. So thanks for that, Bradley. Here's an uh, article that I always like to call out because I think it cuts to the core of what we do. Um, Fern Halper is a very smart woman that I, I know a little bit, uh, did this study, and she's asked the right question. How long does it take to put a defined model? In other words, I already built the model. I built it in Python. I built it in R. I built it in SAS, whatever, uh, Data IQ, Data Robot, whatever. And I want to put that into production. Well, how long does it take people to do this typically? It takes a long time is the answer. And what she does not have on here is really never, never implemented. So most of these things take quite a long time. And now that's her report. This is, I want to be clear, this is my editorial comment. They must be using products like that, right? Because if they were using Oracle, it'd be immediate. I'd build a model, I'd deploy a model. We did a um, we did a hands-on lab yesterday, actually, on the autonomous database. You can go to these live labs, and uh, we built models in the course of about an hour. I guess we went through the whole live lab, went through the notebook. And at the very end of the notebook, we then moved the model up to the transactional, you know, the autonomous tra ATP, aut autonomous transactional database. Just move the model, move it up there, and, and deploy it in some sort of production operation. So it's totally different than what you would use with Python, TensorFlow, uh, SAS, SBIS, any of these um, machine learning offerings that are sort of separate from the data management platform. And this is another uh, corroborating sort of point of view on there. Why do most 87% of data science projects fail to make it into production? And it's because of this, in, this problem of a, a, a data scientist building something in Python or R or some other platform or language and now needing to sort of translate that logic and all the normalization of variables, all the, the ETL, all of the uh, engineered features, all of the math and logic um, and derived features and the normalization of the variables that has been done in the world of the data scientist have to be accounted for and re-implemented. Uh, it's very tedious, time-consuming, and 
If you just do it as part of the database, it's just a very natural build a model with a PL SQL procedure. The model is a first class object, and I can just score it with a SQL function, or I can do the same thing from the R or the AP uh, or the Python. So we really try to simplify things quite a bit. One of the newest things we've been working on are these new notebooks, the Oracle machine learning notebooks that come packaged with the autonomous database. So we're starting to move into a little bit sort of the newer things here, starting out with that. And in those notebooks, we now have 54 example notebooks. I think I have like right over here, if I can go over to this, if it's still working for me, I have, uh, this is one I was going to show maybe later on, but in these, ex um, into the um, uh, Oracle machine learning um, autonomous data warehouse here. And if it didn't log me out while I was doing other things here, I just want to kind of show you all these examples that we've created. So there are now, I think, 54 of these examples. So there's more and more and more. And these are all just different examples of what you can use. And you open up any of these things and, and go off and use them. Uh, we also have all these different notebooks. I'm going to go back to the one I was just playing around with over here, this Tesla one, just because I might have a chance to run that guy for you. It's just something I'm working on, a sort of uh, midstream, so maybe I didn't have a chance to show that. But so we have the new notebooks, and they now speak Python or SQL. So that was something that happened about, I think, three weeks ago. Um, and under the hood, when you're doing all this machine learning, if you're using the going straight directly to the SQL APIs, then it's just as simple as DBMS data mining create model, buy insurance to the name of the model. That's the type of function I'm doing. Remember, I had like six, seven, eight, or nine classification techniques I could use. And which technique I'm using and the settings of that technique are in the settings table. I could have also done this as the create model too and sort of delineate these things right here. But my target column is buy insurance. And if I run this, I'm going to jump over to, well, I'll come back to that. Um, it'll build a model in seconds, minutes at most. Uh, once I have built the model, I can use the model on the fly using dual. I can also, uh, the new thing is we can deploy these via REST endpoints if I want to do that as well. Or I could score a, a whole batch of uh, records all together at the same, a million or a billion records, just score them inside the database. And it'll do that in uh, seconds or minutes, you know, hours, worst case, if you have a slow system, I suppose. Um, if you do an attribute importance, it's the same sort of thing, right? It's uh, create model, attribute importance, buy insurance is the target field, and I get my results, 0.2161. I think later on I show the same thing in uh, R and Python syntax. Um, so here's the Python that now comes with the Oracle Machine Learning Notebooks. Now, the Python is coming initially on the uh, autonomous database in two, three, four months. That will be moved down to the... Um, on-prem uh, offering, so you'll get Python there. Uh, and then the R will later on this calendar year be emerging up on the autonomous uh, database. So we're, we started with, a, you know, first we've always had the R on-prem. Now that's going to go to the cloud later on this calendar year, and the Python is available in the cloud on autonomous, and that'll be moving down to the uh, on-prem as well. So today, if you want to use the Python API and have access to Matplotlib and Scikit-Learn and all those things, or I think more importantly, speak the Python language, your familiar Python language, but drive the in-database 30-something algorithms, it's as straightforward as what we did on the uh, attribute importance, except you're using Python syntax to do that, and you're getting the same results, 0.2161 and so on. So your data science teams can be multilingual and use the same data management and slash machine learning platform, which is, you know, the database. Um, if you are using SQL developer on prem, this is what probably most people use most of the time. Uh, it is a very easy to use drag and drop user interface. You just go to SQL developer and you click on file and you say, uh, or view, and you say enable uh, the machine learning. It will ask you for sys, uh, password to enable a scheme to, to, to create a schema where all these projects and models will be stored for the user. But uh, that's all you have to do when you just kind of configure that and off you go. And it will also generate the, the code under the hood. So that's kind of a nice uh, crutch. If you're not great with writing code, you can use the examples or you can kind of generate some code out of here as well. But it sets up a whole flow, all the major steps, and it does a lot. So like when you do these classification models, it will, it'll do this, this, the train and test as part of that node. It'll also do stratified sampling. And uh, there's just a lot of uh, automation in each one of these nodes that we've uh, uh, advanced over the years. This is, I think, a, a, I guess I'll click that for real quick while I speak. It's a real quick demo of this. This is, you know, probably what most people use most of the time. It is uh, just launch Oracle Data Miner over there. And you have your connections. And you can also uh, run the scripts. You can look at a workflow. You can set up the workflow pretty straightforwardly. 
You can also uh, see the data, see the SQL that's generated behind the scenes. You might want to do uh, some visualization of the data uh, very quickly. And uh, all of this is just, you know, drag and drop, pretty straightforward to use for a citizen data scientist or a data scientist, you know, either kind. The model building will also go off and do some uh, attribute importance and feature, um, you know, data profiling. So it's doing the, uh, for the tar buy insurance field, it's saying what are the key variables for that. It'll also show you other variables that it thinks maybe are not so useful. And the results of that can just be left in the database. And I can come back and use any kind of other product like um, Oracle Apex or Oracle Analytics Cloud or even some uh, any product, any competitive product that, that speaks uh, SQL. Here, we're building four different models by default. You can set all, if you want to override and uh, uh, um, dabble with the uh, advanced features, trying to get a better model, a better lift, you can do that. Um, but you can also take the defaults and pretty good, get a pretty good model. So this is a, a nice, um, you know, sort of a straightforward, quick tour around the block of what Oracle Machine Learning uh, is on-prem with SQL Developer uh, using the Oracle Data Miner user interface. And so when you're done and you apply the data, you, you, you get your results. I think I've already done this. So there are the predictions. There are also the reasons why, which are called prediction details. And uh, I'll just leave those results in the database and come back uh, at this with um, uh, some other product like Oracle um, uh, Analytics Cloud or Oracle Apex or something. If you're using R, if R is your preferred language, you can use R Studio uh, and use the database as a high performance compute environment. Uh, you have access to the same SQL in database parallelized algorithms, but you're now accessing those uh, via R. You can also use the, that's, that's using the transparency layer. You can also download and run open source uh, packages. But like the other one, when I was speaking SQL or speaking Python, I'm just speaking the R syntax, the R language, but it's you know kind of like Google Translate. It's mapping to the native in database functions, and it's giving me the same 0.2161 you know results here. So this is uh, another real quick demo of this. I won't go through the whole thing quite as long here, but when you load this up and you configure this, uh, it loads all these little packages, and the packages are sort of the handshake between the world of R and the world of the in database functions. So where there is equivalent um, exploratory data analysis or equivalent data mining model or whatever will map to that. We'll also do the OCI connectivity so you can see the tables uh, that you have access to. When I do a histogram in R, I don't, in, in, in Oracle Machine Learning, um, I don't do all the math in R. I, I push it down to the um, statistical functions, the RE stats um, that run inside the database. They could run in billions of records. So there are the, 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 the min, max, first, second, third, and fourth quartiles, and all the stats that we need to create those box plots is all pushed down. Um, and then I just render the, 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 the box plot using the graphic engine of, uh, of Oracle, uh, of, of R. So that's that. Real quickly, just give you a kind of example of who uses the product for what. Um, this is one of my favorite ones. I, I, I've worked with these guys for a while, and uh, they've had just some great results that, that they've been able to share over a billion dollars of savings, looking at medical uh, data, getting better outcomes, getting less fraud. Uh, it's a great story. I won't bore you with all the, the details on it, but just Google it and uh, or go to Oracle uh, Machine Learning on O.com and you can see all of that. Uh, Surgery is, is a relatively new one. They do check fraud. I work with them as well. And Eric Probst and uh, Jason uh, Hostler. And uh, they were doing Python and uh, analyzing checks for the likelihood that this check that I'm about to cash is, uh, is fraudulent or not with, with many, many, many uh, input variables. I'm not sure how much of that is a secret or not. And uh, they were able to replicate and do the same thing inside the database using uh, Oracle Machine Learning and get some, some great results. So they've been doing some presentations uh, at the global leaders uh, on what they've done there. And this is another one that I've, I've worked with this, uh, the guy that was here, uh, Ta, uh, is the guy that did all the work. Uh, I worked with him. And uh, he was a BI analyst. He self-taught himself SQL just to kind of get his BI reports done, and he wanted to do a little bit more. And so I kind of coached him up at night. It was, you know, in the evening for me and in the morning for him, I guess, and uh, several different uh, uh, Zoom meetings. And he's off and running and getting great results using uh, Oracle Machine Learning. So, you know, just another example to give, you know, kind of um, give you a feel for that. There's, there's obviously many other ones. Um, hold on, turn that guy off. So what's new? And what's coming soon? So I've already covered a little bit of this of, of what's new um, in some of the other slides. But the, the new thing from the server side is the new algorithms. 
So in 21C, there is the new XG boost algorithms for classification and regression. Now we've 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 brought in the XG boost algorithm into the database and we run it uh, using all the memory of the database. It's highly efficient, scalable uh, gradient tree boosting algorithm. It's been used for a lot of Kaggle contests where the people that win the Kaggle contest will do that. It's very robust against sparsity and, and different sort of uh, uh, data types where you have mixed, dense and sparse data. And it's just a wonderful new technique that we've added. Um, the other one, MSET SPRT, we've got to get a better name to say that, but I guess we just call it MSET, is, is an anomaly detection algorithm, but for processes. So here I'm looking at some sort of process and before, you know, the aircraft engine sort of uh, sputters and starts kicking out, there's there's usually little smaller telltale things coming off sensors that, that kind of um, start to give early warnings to something that might be going wrong. So it's been used in nuclear power plants. It's been around the industry for quite a while. Uh, the inventor of it, uh, um, uh, uh, is is part of Oracle, and we worked with him and Oracle Labs to implement this inside uh, the database. So that's another new feature. Uh, you can also deploy these uh, models uh, with ORDS, Oracle uh, um, uh, REST API services, or or the new REST services that we've just come out with. I'll talk about that in a minute. Uh, in the algorithms, we did a few enhancements, uh, neural, neural networks, so we have a, a faster solver, uh, improved prediction detail, something we also call uh, uh, predictive insights, I'll show that in the uh, auto ML. In the notebooks, as I already sort of teased before, now you can speak Python. So you can speak a mixture. It doesn't have to be all Python or all uh, SQL. You can you can speak uh, in any paragraph. You can just declare it by saying percent Python or percent R or I mean percent Python or percent SQL or percent script and or percent Markdown language. So now the the notebooks could be multilingual. Um, and in that, we did the same thing that we've done with Oracle R uh, Enterprise, the part of Oracle Machine Learning for R is what we call it now. The same thing there we do, we do with the transparency layer, the parallel distributed access algorithms, uh, using calling the OML for SQL, but from a, a Python or uh, from an R API, we now do from a Python API. We can also do uh, embedded execution uh, to callouts. Now, on the autonomous database, we do those embedded execution callouts to uh, packages that we've hosted for you. When we move this to on-prem, you'll be able to have a lot more flexibility to download whatever package you want to install in your on-prem instance. And we've also added something called AutoML. Now, AutoML comes with two, two halves to it, AutoML. On the server side, there's a lot of logic that's going to walk through, and I'll show you that in a minute. On the GUI side, we have the new AutoML user interface. So, let me get this guy's attention here. Is that right? Okay, so, so, on the, so on the server side, there's this new AutoML um, functionality that we use to do uh, the to make the AutoML user interface the easier. So we have the automatic algorithm selection, which is going to say I'm going to identify uh, based on a model that's looked at a lot of different data sets and said which kind of algorithms work best on this sparse data or this dense data or this data with a lot of correlations uh, or uh, you know uh, covariances and so on. The algorithms are going to be narrowed down using a meta model for what probably is going to work. So we don't have to do an exhaustive search of every technique. We can throw out, let's say, a decision tree because they don't work very well on sort of brutal data. Um, you get sort of brutal trees if you have a, like, you know, sort of a lot of sparsity. Um, adaptive sampling, we're going to run uh, some tests to see as we keep on diving a little bit deeper into the data, do our models get more accurate or, you know, how much data is 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 enough? So we will do that to simplify the amount of data that we have to uh, mine, and then we'll also do automatic stratified sampling. So if you have unbalanced data, like 90% of ones and 10% of zeros, we'll, we'll do 100% um, uh, sampling of the rare uh, uh, rare uh, values and downsample the other ones. Automatic feature selection is going to do something where we use um, the, the random forest. We'll use the attribute importance generated from random forest, the attribute importance generated from the minimum description length, we'll use the correlations, uh, the Pearson's correlation function, and we use a fourth one that I'm trying to recall what that one is, but it's the, it's the, uh, it's the average of those four different techniques. We'll say these are the attributes that seem to have the most information in them, and the other ones will we'll denoise the data, we'll get rid of those ones to help you build a better model. And then when we go to the models, we've narrowed it down, we've narrowed down the features, we've got a, a reasonable set of data that we're going to use. Then we go do the automatic uh, tuning of, uh, of the models, tuning the hyperparameters. In a, in a systematic, intelligent way, and all of this is done in an automated way. 
Uh, at the end, we'll do something called feature prediction impact, which says I will now, sh for, for the model that I've selected, the best model, I will shuffle the input variables. So if Charlie had a checking account balance of $4 million, I don't, but if I did, and somebody else had a, had a checking account balance of $12, well, it'll shuffle around. So now I have $12, the other guy has $4 million. And if you change the values for everyone for each attribute and it changes the prediction a lot, then that is that that indicates that those variables have more predictive power than other ones, perhaps. So it's a it's a cross model generic way of getting a little bit more um, explainability for the model. We also, of course, still have the prediction predictive uh, prediction details. So in the GUI in the user interface, it's uh, designed for citizen data scientists, but also data scientists and developers. And uh, I gave a talk earlier about, I think I called it six clicks to, to, uh, to a better model. And, and the first click is uh, the one where you say I want to launch AutoML. So I'm going to go back over here and see if I can't um, go back over here, show you where AutoML comes in. AutoML comes in right, where was it? Yeah, okay, these are the experiments. But if I, if I want to create a new one, first thing I do is, is launch. So I'll click here and I'll say uh, uh, buy insurance. Why do I get that thing not working? Buy insurance uh, experiment uh, 77, I'm going to call this one. The data source is going to be some sort of um, data source, like I'm going to use this guy right here, and I'm going to say, uh, OK. The Once it refreshes these features, it kind of does a quick little profile on the data there. If I go over here and I say buy insurance, uh, sorry, I typed that in there, buy, buy, B-U-I. BUI, buy insurance is my target field. My case ID is going to be customer insurance. And I'm going to save this guy just as it's a good thing to always save it. And then if I start this guy, I can start him, but I can say faster results or better results. I'm going to say faster results just to let this thing go. And it usually takes me four, five, six, seven, or eight minutes to do the whole thing on the uh, uh, when I do this. So I'm not going to sit around here and wait for this thing to finish, but I will just let you kind of see as it as it starts to, to run off and launch this thing, it'll set up to run. It will tell me that it's going to do the uh, algorithm selection, which is doing right now. Then it'll do the adaptive sampling, which I talked about, the feature selection and the model tuning. And it'll just kind of zip through that whole process. So while we're waiting for this to kind of set up, uh, I'm going to go back to PowerPoint because I'm watching the clock tick by. So that's it. Six clicks and you're off to a pretty good model. It'll give you a leaderboard. It'll show you the attribute importance. Uh, it'll keep on running, and as we kind of run a little bit further, you get better and better models. The leaderboard will keep on getting updated as it kind of more intelligently searches through the hyperparameter settings and, and, the, and, and the models and so on until it finally gives a very good model. Now, if I like that model, I can, I can look at the metrics for that model, maybe sort this on balanced accuracy, and then if I can pick a model here, I can see the prediction impacts of that model. And also go see the, well, the confusion matrix is the other thing I could see. Um, I can also select that model and create a notebook. So when I create a notebook, all I do is give it a name. It's going to create a notebook. In release one of this, it's going to create the notebook in Python code. So if I just reran this thing, it's going to rebuild the model using the same method, using the same model and the settings that the auto ML has just finished for me. And uh, I can take and extend this in Python. I can use the model name, which is this, uh, uh, I'll show it on the next slide, I think. The model name right here, RF, random forest, blah, blah, blah. I can do a prediction probability of predicting yes using that. Now, also, make sure there's a glitch right now. Make sure you capitalize all that. If you use the, the small uh, letters, it will uh, throw an error. So we'll, we're, we're, the, the fix is already in. It's just being rolled out on, on every system. So if you happen to run into a glitch there, that's the issue. You're gonna have, you have to capitalize that. So with AutoML, I can also deploy the model via REST endpoints. So I can I can deploy the model via the SQL worksheet, the SQL notebook, and just, I mean, excuse me, the Python notebook, and just run Python scripts and rebuild the model, deploy the model, whatever I want. I can do the same thing in SQL. We will generate a SQL code notebook for you in the near future. And then you can also, uh, and just run it in the database. I can go to SQL Developer. I could move the model up to Autonomous Database. I could do a lot of different things. And I can also, generate the REST endpoints for this, and then deploy that using the machine learning services. So on the machine learning services, I can take and deploy and run and score the Oracle uh, in-database models that I just did using um, the REST APIs, and I can use any other third-party model using the Onyx format. Now, the Onyx format is sort of a standardization. It was started by Microsoft and um, other different 
machine learning platforms use it. So if you download, an, uh, let's say, an Onyx model for image classification, I could take my dog, Sir Barks, a lot over here, and I could say, uh, what kind of animal is he? Is he a beagle, a foxhound? So this is a previously built image model that I'm going to use or a text model that I'm doing behind the scenes over here, and I'm finding the similarity of one model to another, or I'm looking at topics. These are all models that have been previously built in the Onyx format where I can store, version, and compare machine learning models. And here's the APIs for that. And so what you would expect from a, from a REST endpoint uh, uh, approach, and this is a quick little demo here that I don't think I'm going to take the time to go through the whole thing here, but it's just the uh, um, using the OML um, services to take the model that I've already built and deploy it uh, through an REST endpoint. So very straightforward if you're comfortable with REST and the models do not have to, the data does not have to hit the database. It's just running uh, outside the database. And uh, you can we use a mini batch approach to get the probabilities here and so on. So probability of a zero, 92% probability of the other, uh, we see what it is. You can display that in whatever kind of format or or whatever we use in Postman right here, but you can you can put that in a in a in a uh, any kind of application you want. Roadmap Oracle Machine Learning for Python will uh, embrace the additional SQL algorithms. Uh, it does not do, uh, for example, XGBoost and a couple other ones. So that we'll, we will pick up the ones that we may have dropped off there. Um, we'll support date type columns, and we'll, the big one is OML for Python will be available on prem and databases and cloud service. So that's what's coming there in the near future. The Oracle Machine Learning for R is going to do the same thing, expose all for SQL algorithms will be exposed to R. Um, we'll uh, support the recent, more recent releases of uh, R, um, and we'll add the REST API, and then this will also be coming onto the OML notebooks later on this calendar year. Some other things just before we wrap up, I think that what's really cool with all this, I mean, I think you, you could say we clearly have enough machine learning functionality right now to solve a lot of problems, and I think where machine learning is going and needs to go is beyond the data scientist into something that's a lot more of how do I deploy this? So these are just a couple of teasers. We've been doing this into uh, in, in these live labs and, and with various different blogs and YouTubes. But if I've done all the predictive modeling for which employees are likely to leave or stay, and I have my predictions, well, I should just be able to put this in Apex, use the faceted search, use a few little graphics here, and do that and really sort of operationalize it. Here are the key attributes, or you could, you could, you could think of that as the predictive detail, also the attribute importance, they're different things, but this is a better graphing kind of widget to do that. Um, I could say, here are all my employees that have a very high likelihood of leaving with high number of years, so I may want to drill down and see who are these people. So Apex becomes a very logical and very easy extension or, or deployment uh, option for us. Here's one that we did in this two-step approach to fraud that says, here's the reasons why we think this, this uh, uh, accident report might be fraudulent. Here's the reasons why. These are prediction details, which is XML. We could probably clean that up a little bit. But um, this is now in uh, in Apex. And I could even uh, do, you know take that further. We have a little form you can fill out and, and have the um, insurance investigator review that and then rebuild the model with a supervised learning technique. That's what we do in the in the fraud live lab, which which I would recommend you you give it a try. I have that and, and other things in the uh, in the links at the end. Another thing that's new that I think is very exciting is Oracle Analytics Cloud has been working to have tighter and tighter integration with the autonomous database and specifically the machine learning in the database. So now you can go register a model. So maybe Charlie built a model and somebody else wants to go off and apply that model. Um, so they can set up a flow here. So go find the model. Uh, here's my data set in OAC. There's the model that I rebuilt. And it shows all the details of the model and the settings and so on. I can set up a flow. The flow will run 100% inside the database. And then when I'm done, all the predictions and insights are there for me to review, and I can filter and sort. And it's a much better platform or approach, you know, that some people have said, use the right tool for the right job. And this is a much better, I think, the appropriate platform for deploying predictions and insights. Um, here's one where we're now looking at the fraudulent cars. I can click in what's called brushing. I can I can highlight uh, uh, the thirty to $39,000 cars, and they all highlight over here, and I can kind of interrogate the data. But the value is I have all these probabilities and explanations, and I could do this for a number of different uh, uh, variables of interest. 
Here's one of my favorite ones. Uh, this is becoming a live lab. We're going to do that on April 28th. But this is now saying for why, and we use the Kaggle data set, what are, the, what are the terms in the reviews that are most correlated with uh, good wines and most correlated with bad wines? And this DM dollar VL wine, that little cryptic piece of code over there is actually the model view of the support vector machine model I used to with, with some other people that did this with me um, that I used to build a predictive model on the price of the line, the origins of the line, France, United States, wherever, and the Kaggle the, and the reviews, the line spectator kind of reviews. This is a Kaggle data set that you can use. Uh, this will be part of a live lab, and it's, it's, it's on one of the blogs and YouTubes out there. So that's a lot of fun. But where that, that, that's, n that's not the main message of what I wa wanted to share with you. Um, what I wanted to share with you was all this is very approachable. It's very accessible to the Oracle community. And so I think that I've, I've been observing this natural sort of evolution from an Oracle data professional to an Oracle data scientist. And so the point is that, you know, sure, 80% of the work is just setting up the data, data extraction, deriving new attributes. We call that feature engineering. And there's this little part where the machine learning, where, where the machine learning happens, okay? And kind of like Penn, Penn and Teller that explain how their, how their uh, magic trick, tricks work. Um, I'm here to say this is not so rocket science. It's, it, it, it is. Uh, pretty straightforward, and uh, if you read the blogs, if you read a little bit of the book, and you take the, uh, if you follow the examples that we have, you you too can do this because there's a standard methodology. You have to know your business, you have to know your data, you have to explore, you know, prepare the data, and there's a lot of things you do. The stuff in the the, the ones in in um, that I've dimmed here are the ones we have defaults for or automated features for. So you don't have to do all these things. You can really Focus on the important stuff, getting a well-defined business problem, assemble the right data, uh, develop engineered features. These are the kind of things that you want to use your domain expertise and your Oracle data professional skills to do. And when you do that, we make machine learning simple and you can harvest much more information and insights out of your data by just simply extending your, your deep skills in Oracle technology a little further by adding just a little bit of machine learning. If you're using the drag and drop GUI, all those different steps, well, they're nodes. And you kind of drag and drop them together and it'll do all the things and it's kind of very, very easy. If you're using the notebooks, well, there's a bunch of examples. There are up to 54 example reusable notebooks that come packaged with Oracle machine learning on the autonomous database. So it's very you know, easy to get started. Uh, just take some of these notebooks and sort of repurpose them. I have a blog series out there you're welcome to read. I haven't finished writing the whole thing. I'm still going to write the last two ones, but the, the gist of it is, is in the first ones, I think, and the rest is uh, is sort of icing on the cake in some ways. But there's there's YouTubes on this. There are links to other resources. There's explanations and examples, and I encourage you to take a look at that if you want to, or just you know take a couple of courses or or follow the uh, read the documentation. But give, give Oracle Machine Learning a try. Um, if you do and you get good at it and you work at Oracle or you work at your own company, you may want to take this even further and start building applications. And so these are just a couple of applications. I worked on this one with the uh, HCM team. There's a whole methodology under the hood that, that assembles the right data for like your bonus amount, your salary compared to your peers, your last review, your review versus your, your self review versus your boss's review. Um, and it builds a predictive model, and then, and then this is all interactive. I can do what-if analysis. I can say, what if I give the guy a raise or a promotion or whatever, is he likely to stay? And all of that is enabled by the math that's, that's sort of very hidden here, but uh, that's, that's what we do. There are many, many resources and links. I think I already put them uh, in the uh, chat window as resources. You're welcome to take a look at those things. I wanted to call your attention to the uh, analytics and data Oracle user community TechCast days that are coming up. May 11, 12, and 13, you're welcome to join those. Those are free. They'll have uh, 90 minutes, well, three hours on machine learning on the 11th, three hours on spatial and graph on the 12th, and three hours of hands-on labs for Oracle Analytics Cloud on the 13th. So you're welcome to join that. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Uh, that's how to reach me. I think I've got one more here if you want to review that or, or reach out to me. And I'm going to go over... Thank you for your time. I'm going to go over to see if there are any questions. So oh, this guy finished. Or he's just about finishing over here. I can come back and show you that if you want. But I want to go back over here to see if there are any questions of any kind. Q&A. No questions. So I'm not going to keep you any later than you need to. Uh, it's almost Friday. But if you do have any questions, now's your time to, uh, to answer any of your questions. Please, uh, please speak up now if you have any questions. Okay, we will leave it there. 
thank you very much for your time and attention. Um, appreciate it. If you have any questions, follow up with me, and good luck with Oracle Machine Learning. Take care, guys.